Welcome to this edition, an interview with Reverend Aaron Long, as we wait for him to come in. Um, he's already on standby. We have about 10,000 questions for him, reviewing the past meeting from the 29th of December, 2022. And we talked about the UECNA, German Reformed Liturgy, um, the new title, Anglican and Reformed, a little bit about Peter Robinson, some discussion of the Reformed Episcopalians, both high and low, again, whatever that means. Um, we're definitely going to need if we're going to get a thousand questions answered, we're going to need multiple meetings. Um, it was a wonderful interview, some background on ENRs, Evangelical and Reformed, um, commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism and the vigor with which it was pursued in the church as I understood it, Pilgrim. Uh, reformed, I guess you'd call it, back in 1757. Um, Ursinus, as a student of, I believe it was Bollinger, if not mistaken, uh, it came up with, we talked about the German Palatinate liturgy, and uh, afterwards I looked through that very quickly, and it, it looks exactly almost like the English prayer book. Uh, here's Aaron coming now. Just wait until the connection is made in terms of audio and video. For some reason. All right, I think I got it now, Donald. Okay, we're just waiting for the picture, the video. Oh, look at you all dressed up today. Well, the uniform of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got yours on. Well, I got it's all I own anymore. I was telling somebody the other day, I was raised in an environment that if you have a profession, you're supposed to wear a shirt and tie. Yeah. And I come to the conclusion when I was in seminary that this is more comfortable than wearing a tie all the time. Yeah, are you more relaxed today? I don't have the video yet. I don't know why it's not coming in. Uh, Let's well, see oh. what I got on this side. All right, I had there to hit a right All right, let me see if I can get my sound up. I'm working on this darn apple, and I'm not quite sure how to work this thing the right way all the time. Because this is the one that I got. All right, we don't want to do that. All right, you hear me on here? I can see and hear you. I'm fine. Well, I if just you don't took... mind, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us through the course of this past weekend, this wonderful Lord's Day. We ask you, dearest Heavenly Father, that you would allow your word to dwell richly within us, that it may renew our mind and transform us. We ask you, dearest Heavenly Father, that you would bless the conversation that Donald and I are getting ready to have, that it may be edifying to those that may hear it. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I was thinking after we talked the last time, about dress and about what about how we dress that's why i brought up that's why i asked you the question earlier this morning oh okay because i've been dealing with some circumstances with some dunkards and with some anglicans and with some other groups and i've come to a conclusion and that is is number one people want to play dress up they don't actually want to do the job people would rather wear to use military terms and this is why i ask you the question they'd rather wear their dress blues than actually put on their battle uniform and what i mean when i, I say that is is you see it in anglicans where they like to play dress up a lot but i'd argue i've seen it with presbyterians and baptists too and it's not just with their clothes it's with their titles and with their this and with their that and they like to be acknowledged as reverend or pastor or this or that or the other. And they don't want to go out and actually do the hard work of the ministry and take the fight to the enemy. 
we are stuck in a world where nobody has, pardon the way I put this, the testicular fortitude to stand up to the devil in the ways he comes against us. Well, I I, everybody wants to be a general and nobody wants to listen to the master sergeant, which is why I said the other thing I said to you today. Well, My boss Snyder used to always say he'd rather listen to a master sergeant any day of the week over somebody that went to West Point because he said the master sergeants had a whole lot more sense and actually knew what they was doing. I will. And I think this problem. Oh, go on, I, Donald. I will forbear and forego some rough military humor when it comes to testicular shrinkage, and I'll just leave it with that term, but we have some other rough terms for it, which I'll not mention here. <laughs> I, but I we see it everywhere. I was talking to some boys the other day about the PCA, because I'm in a conversation group with some PCA pastors. And I appreciate the PCA. Don't get me wrong. I ain't got no problem with it as a general idea. But what I've seen with the PCA is an issue to where they so caught up in either wanting to go the Rick Warren path and create these mega churches, or they want to give in to make this sort of mushy, nasty, evangelical mindset to where they're undercutting their Westminster standards. Now, I got my ups and downs with the Westminster. I actually would subscribe to everything in there but the former church government. And I actually see the directory of worship as being ultimately a book, a prayer book of made up of nothing but rubrics, but that's neither here nor there. But ultimately, I ain't got no problem with the Westminster. I like the Westminster, to be completely honest, but I am dealing with Westminster pastors that want to reject covenant baptism of infants, and they want to accept the fact that they can be Baptist. You want to be Reformed Baptist, go be Reformed Baptist. Don't claim you're Presbyterian. Don't allow your members to get away with not baptizing their babies. Uh, you're not doing your job. I saw it with Covenant, with this whole thing with the Revoice. That should have been shut down by their assembly. You know all about Revoice, don't you? Oh, Revoice. The, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, it hurts my soul that those people weren't just excommunicated from the PCA the moment they brought it up. It's anti-biblical, it's anti-Christ, yet they soft-handed them. It's like all this crap with Spangler and Amy Bird that happened a couple of years ago. I have absolutely no respect for the OPC, but for them kicking Spangler out for speaking the truth or not kicking him out, punishing Spangler for speaking the truth instead of driving that demonic witch Amy Bird out screaming and kicking and said, I mean, you know what I'm saying. In the old days, they'd have tied her a stake and set her a fire for the demon stuff she was spouting out. Yeah. What's wrong with these supposedly conservative organizations? Yeah, I haven't followed the Amy Bird issue. I did a little bit, the revoice. I hope to get some PCA pastors in whom I know and trust and talk with them they have some severe issues with the revoicers, but I think that church Memorial Presbyterian has pulled out of the PCA finally. Good. Why didn't the PCA kick them out? That's why I have no respect for them. Yeah. They should have booted them to the curb when they did this mess. Yeah. I mean, it's like going to an Anglican and all they want to do is play dress up and put on their girl papers clothes, <laughs> bounce around, but they don't want to do any else to hold anymore. Yeah, and it so, is one of the most frustrating things. Supposedly, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry, Donald. I'm running my mouth. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I ain't got to know what this is. I'm going to get this. I know that's what that is. He's trying. We got two different Wi-Fi's here. In the sanctuary and one education that keeps trying to bounce back and forth. Oh, okay. I wanted to ask you. Who My Wi-Fi system is a little bit. Bad. Who might you recommend for further interviews? 
That's a good question. In all honesty, the big one I've been working with lately is Reverend J.T. Brantley. He just got uh, voted in down at Boger Reformed yesterday. He was one I picked up in Anglicanism, but he actually, in the UECNA, but he actually has his doctorate in Christian education, and he starts these classical Christian schools. And he does them from an interesting perspective. He takes a homeschool group and has a way of piecing it together to where you can actually get a classical Christian school started under the aegis of a homeschool group meeting in a church to where you don't have to hold under a lot of these government guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping he's real impressed. I'm hoping to talk oh, to Doc Reverend Dr. Jeff Hubler, speaking of titles. Oh, I want to talk. I want to. We've been we've been wanting to meet up with Hubbler anyway. Turns out one of our crowd, when he was a Baptist, before he became a Presbyterian, before he became an Anglican, Chris King, Dr. Chris King down at St. John's Reform, he was friends with Hubbler whenever he was up there and serving a Baptist church in Appomattox. Yeah, Jeff has run a successful Christian school he did up at Christ Memorial until he had some kind of run-in with Lenny Riches. Still don't know the, all the details there. But he said, I've had it. It's unhealthy. <laughs> and he went down to Appomattox and started a church and school. Both schools had 100. And, and the one still operating in Appomattox have 100 students. So Paul, uh, Jeff, will, you'll never hear much from him. He's not a showboater. He wears his collar. He's a prayer book man. Just a quiet, scholarly guy who really puts his life work into the school even more than the church. But Jeff had the flu last week, so he's going to try to work something out this week. Maybe I'm next Saturday, Sunday and Monday, I'm going down to Ligonier uh, Ministries in Orlando for a conference on Professor J. Gresham Machen. So I'll be out of pocket for Sunday through Tuesday. Now, I wish I was retired and had the time to go at, jaunting around like that to that stuff. I don't do much of it anymore. I used to, <laughs> not now. I put on the collar, you and Je Neil Beck kind of, oh, dress of the day. So I threw the thing on. I found a bigger one, which is nice. <laughs> well, I'll but, see if I can maybe get a hold of Brantley, you say his name is? What's his first name? Yeah. JT, I'm in contact with JT. Okay. Okay. What are we doing here? It's recording. Did you hear me? Yeah, it was kind of breaking up a little. It's bit. I'm trying to dash. Get you in contact with JT. Yeah. He's got a good head on his shoulder, and he's a young man. I wanted to, uh, you talked about Latimer. How many students do you have there? Well, now JT's the one that could probably answer the question better. I'm working with about 12. 20. 12. 12. Okay. Well, that's helpful. I'm working with 12. I've got three of them in my congregation that we're bringing up. I have one that's already been priested, one that's going to be deaconed in February, and one that's starting out. Now, I got to laughing at all three of my crowd. None of them want anything to do with what I do. But the first one, his father was a reform pastor who retired and died a couple of years ago. Jim Neese, he's a retired detective from the Charlotte Police Force. Oh, wow. And he actually started seminary because he wanted to connect with his father more and he wanted to become a pastor, but he felt the calling in the midst of it. He's 74, but what he does is he goes around and he supplies. It's like Jim was talking yesterday. He's preached in seven different churches just this past year. ENR churches? Uh, ENR churches, Anglican churches. Basically, Jim fills in where he's needed. Uh, he goes where he's needed. Uh, then I got Dwayne Riches, who is a former basketball player. He played for Ratcliffe University, and he played in China and Europe. He's a 6'10 black fella. But Dwayne oh, yeah. I saw that. is Dwayne is working on – Dwayne is – He's the one that's going to be deaconed in 
uh, February, he is working toward doing youth ministry and homeless ministry. He's taking over my programs with that. Okay. Because, see, I set up about five, six years ago, a program I called FYI, Faith Youth Initiative, which they kept complaining that we couldn't get a, get a youth group together, even though we had 120 people showing up, plenty of kids in church. What it was is I couldn't get the parents to all agree on a time. And they just sit there and fight, not bring their kids and this and that and the other. So I went out and got kids. We went into the trailer parks, went into the highways and hedges and drug them in. And we deal with these disadvantaged kids. We bus in between 20 and 30 kids every Thursday night and Saturday morning. And Dwayne's taking over that program. Oh, nice. And back in 2019, we started our homeless program after I got into a fight with the uh, Mayor of Lexington, and I went into the <laughs> I went into the city council meeting. They gave me my three minutes, and I took Matthew twenty five and told them that all of them were going to go to hell and burn for eternity because none of them were saved because they were going to close down the homeless shelter, and showed them from the Bible how they weren't. And then I so I started my own program, and we feed about forty two families in the county a month, and. We have a program set up to help them get jobs and apartments as they come out of the homeless shelter. And Dwayne's going to take over those two for me after he gets deacon. And then I got another guy that's coming up right now that functionally is, he was never patched in, but he was associated with the Hells Angels and all that. That after he's gone through some stuff with his father and his mother passing, Donnie's about four years younger than me. He is wanting to do hospice chaplaincy. And he's had a real turnaround in his life, and we've been working with him. He's a real big guitarist. He played him and my pianist at our Holy Communion service had on Christmas Eve. Played He played guitar, and the pianist played uh, with him, and they did all the music for Christmas Eve. Okay. So you've got you're, – you're like the master sergeant. You're getting things done, not like the general liking the titles and position and clothes and – well, that's my thing. I mean, one of the running jokes is I love, I laugh every time I hear one of these people go on Facebook and talk about they've been named Cannon or they've been named this or they've been named that. And I laugh about it because you probably don't even know this, but I'm the Canon of the Ordinary for the Archbishop of the UECNA. And I never put it on anything. I never say it. I It's like I told Peter, I just want it in my back pocket for whenever I to people that are interested in titles to let them think I'm just some stupid redneck from North Carolina and be able to whip it out and get them all wore, tore up. Yeah. I, that was one of several things that the REC went through in the nineties. They were th hustling titles and I didn't understand it. I can, I was in and out, out of port, the canon and Dean and suffered. Everybody was a title hung title hungry and it was so off-putting i was just reading polycarp's letter to the philippians this morning and he calls himself a presbyter amongst the presbyters right like peter does calls himself an elder among the elders in first peter 5 1 and I, whatever well, Bishop Robinson, he's a historian sort of like you, and he's done his, his work with with all the family. He, he's really interested in Vermilly and Bootser and mainly Melanchthon. But one of the things we got into a conversation about is I straight up asked him, what is your take on the three? On, on the three? And Peter said from his reading of the formularies and his reading of the men that put the formularies together, Anglicanism is always viewed it as being two and a half, not three, because all the bishop is is a presbyter that has been elected and given additional duties. Yeah. By the way, uh, where is Bishop Peter Robinson on communion? And don't use the terms low or high with me because that won't work. I know, Donald. Peter is Calvinist spiritual presence. He's what? He is a, he on Holy Communion, he is Calvinist spiritual presence. Okay. 
Anglican. Yeah, he, he is very militantly that. If you're going to get into an argument with Peter about sacraments, it would be baptism, not communion, because you and him are about dead on on communion. What about baptism? Peter is probably closer to a Lutheran. That's where his Lutheran shows. Okay. More so than, actually more so than even predestination. Peter accepts single predestination, which the running joke is, is if you accept single, you have to accept double. So, and even he'll say that, but he says single, but. So he rejects double predestination. He doesn't reject it. He just doesn't say it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. And Peter says it's more, he said, theologically, it's more a political move than it is actually a theological move. Because he's like he said, well, Donald, in all honesty, if you say you accept single predestination, it means you accept double predestination. Exactly. So it's exactly. more it's more a dance with words than it is anything. Yeah, tap dancing. But it's because we're still trying to purge out the last of the reber garbage we have left. Yeah, now what... Peter's got an interesting history. He was with the FCE when it was what it was we will be talking with reverend graham ray tomorrow mm -hmm. uh from the fceec mm -hmm. a group that split off peter was with them then he came to the united states and attended holy rood seminary which is mm -hmm. anglo anglo high catholic mm -hmm. uh which was a weird transition never connected with the American counterpart to the FCE, the RES in that day. I don't know why, but he didn't. And he went off and hung out and clung, had collegial fraternal relations with all the different Tractarian elements in the country, which mm -hmm. I've never understood. And then the church he pastored in Phoenix turned Roman oh, yeah. Catholic and then somehow he's back with the UECNA that was being run by Reber. So I am just, you know, the I, it's bouncing around in my head. How does that happen? Is he as shifty as the one in Dallas? I don't know. I don't Peter think. Peter isn't really shifty. Peter, I think, if given his druthers, would be in a college somewhere. I think he is a bishop because there was no other options at the time, if that makes any sense. I guess. Peter's not a power grabber, if that makes any sense. Peter likes to sit around and have these deep conversations. That's what Peter wants to do. That's why, in the end of the day, I ended up getting elected president of the House of Delegates because Evidently, their meetings used to run for three days, and I can do in three hours what they did in three days. <laughs> what uh, uh, this relates to a question uh, about popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, how does Anglicanism, prayer book churchmanship, sell itself in American culture? I don't want to sound like a salesman or Rick Warren, but what? is the draw why the draw is is there is a depth that is absent from all the rest of the modern manifestations of american christianity what we have to sell ourselves is is as a true form of christianity i was reading a couple of studies a couple of years ago you go back to the 1950s yeah. In the 1950s, if you were raised Lutheran and you got angry at the Lutheran church, you may go to the Reformed church down the road. And then if you got angry at the Reformed church, you'd leave and go to the Methodist church. And there was this continuing, even though they may be separate schools of Christian thought, you stayed within the broader Christian community. Now, because of the rise of the contemporary Christian movement and Pentecostalism, which spawned it, these contemporary Christian megachurches don't gain non-believers. They cannibalize other churches. If you go through a roll book in these megachurches, these are not people that have never accepted Christ. 
These are, we've cannibalized all these other churches by offering them all this other stuff. Well, the thing is, is when people get mad at a contemporary Christian church, they just don't go back to church. Why would you? I mean, I've said this before. If I wanted to hear a bad rock band, I'd go on a Saturday night to a bar and listen to them. I could at least drink beer while I did it. I'm not going to get up on Sunday morning and go listen to a bad rock band. And I, I that sounds crude. No, it's, yeah, makes sense. And if I wanted to watch Oprah Winfrey and get that as my message, I can stay at home and watch that on TV. I don't need to see some guy up there faking it in his uniform with his grease back hair and all the rest of the mess and his, his thousand dollar outfit that looks like he just rolled out of bed. I don't need to go and get said. So what's happening is, is you've got people looking for something genuine and true. Yeah. And the problem with the non-liturgical forms, and it's, I believe everybody has the liturgy, but I'm talking about the people that follow the Westminster Directory, Directory of Worship, things like that. Prayer book, German Reformed Litany, the Pilate. Oh, no, 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 no. Prayer book, Continental Reform. Let's say Continental Reform, because the Dutch liturgy, the Palatinate German Reform Litany, the Westminster Directory of Worship is something different. Yeah. It doesn't flesh anything out. I'll get, I wish the Presbyterians would have kept Knox's forms where Knox basically just adopted Geneva. I do not like, the Westminster Directory of Worship is a spectacular book of rubrics. It's a terrible directory of worship yeah. because basically it doesn't give anything to hang anything on if that makes any sense. Yep. And it gives them a bizarre view of the regular principle of worship. I wish I could find my copy of the prayer book from that. I've got a copy of the 1662 where they went through and they showed every word in the 1662 is either drawn directly from scripture or is an allusion to scripture. Yeah, that's my, my sense uh, in terms of the salesmanship. I hate that to word, but well, it's what you got to say is that it seeks to be biblical. We are valid historical Christianity. I mean, and what we've got to do, and this is this is going to sound a little strange coming out of me, but I've been making this argument, and I've got JT and a couple others on board. We have got to do two things in Anglicanism. One, we have to learn to separate Anglicanism from Englishness. One of the drawbacks to Anglicanism is it is so tied to this English cultural mindset. Even the title. Yeah. We've got to figure out how to separate those two. And number two, and I think this is a little problem with both Presbyterians and the Anglicans. We have got to divorce their construct from their socioeconomic position historically in America. Presbyterians and Anglicans in America have always been upper middle class, upper class. Upper middle class and upper class churches tend to have a tendency to run liberal quickly. We need to get back to a working class J.C. Ryle Anglicanism. An Anglicanism for the masses. And part of that is getting rid of the dress up. I mean, ultimately, I am a fan of wearing my cassock surplus tippet and hood because the way I look at it is that's just choir dress. It's showing my office. It's what I'm doing up front. When I get up in the morning, what I'm in 99% of the time is my clerics. And the way I view my clerics is the same as a police officer putting on his uniform or a military man putting on his uniform. It just designates what I am. And then I go out into the community and we've got to get Anglicanism back into the community. Community. It's got yeah. to, they're all so eat up. And I love, you know, I love the prayer book, but they're so eat up with everything revolves around what goes on in the sanctuary. And while what goes on in the sanctuary is important, 100%, if it's not leading to what goes on outside it, you're basically creating a holy huddle. And that holy huddle is just going to die over time. Yeah. I got a big banner hanging over my door. 
at the top of the ramp at the church now that says you are now entering your mission field. So everybody, when they walk out of church, the last thing they see out the door is they're oh. going out in the mission field. Because I got into this. We got into this professionalism with the clergy too. And what that turns into is this idea, and this cuts across denominational lines. We have allowed church members to think that it's the pastor's job to go get new members. Well, I told them one day during a sermon, who do I see during the course of the week? I spend my time counseling. I spend my time doing worship services. I spend my time working with these programs. Everybody I see in order to fulfill my calling is within the walls of the church. The people that are out there in the mission field are the laity sitting in the pews. We have got to empower our laity to go out and to do what they're called to do, to be Jesus in the world, to be the salt and the light. We got to get out of our holy huddle. I was reading, I don't know where it was, a few days ago, where it may have been about Irenaeus, late second century martyr. Mm -hmm. I think he, some somebody made the comment that what extended the church in that century wasn't so much the clergy, it was the people and the way they lived. And that that had a witness and a pull and a draw. Uh, what I was going to ask. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and on the socioeconomic element, Professor John, John Frame has said on more than one occasion that Presbyterians are almost inevitably tied to the upper middle class yeah because it insists upon an educated clergy it insists upon a detailed confession which draws those that want to think and read and be educated whereas you know the pool guy who comes here and fixes my pool every week you know you got to be able to talk to, or uh, I, i'll use the military analogy some chaplains would become known for hanging out with the captain and the senior yeah. officers, and they'd forget the seamen down in the bilges. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You got to go down in the bilges and the engine room. You got to go out at 11 o'clock at night on the fantail with seaman Schmuckatelli standing the evening watch. Really? And act actually, some of the best captains and leaders were the kind of men who insisted upon visiting around the ship. And I can tell some stories on that. Um, bad leaders are not concerned about the people on their ship. They're concerned about themselves. The best military leaders were the guys who took care of Johnny in, in the trenches. Well, now, I've learned this working with the homeless program. Ultimately, 90% of pastors want to have nothing to do with the homeless. They want nothing to do with the poor. And when I would go out there and I would work with these people, I mean, every other Friday, this Friday, we're going to deliver food. And I'll go out into the tent cities to take food out to them. Those people haven't seen a preacher in years, even the ones that were raised in churches. Because the preachers just don't want to. Preachers have to have their days off and their sabbaticals and all this other stuff. And you know what? That's not what we're called to. I was raised in an environment. It's my job to visit my parishioners. It's my job to go and sit with everybody that needs to be sat with. And it's the laziness of the clergy that won't fall back on all this academic mumbo jumbo. Yeah. And yeah. not actually. I'm do getting, what they're you know, I'm. To do. You know, I'm kind of an academic myself and, you know, reading these wonky journals over here. <laughs> these guys find things that, you know, you wouldn't even think of, but they're just quibbling about this and that. Oh, I'm not talking academics. Yeah, I know. Westminster Seminary was notorious. You know, I was talking to my son here a while back, he, and he's a doctor in education. He said, Dad, you, you said something to someone that was a little bit sharp. 
And I said, you know, Robert, I come from a tradition that does not do counseling well, does not do preaching well, does not do outreach well. We just weren't trained in that tradition. We're trained in a Canada be forensic theologians. So, you know, I, I'm bringing also to this discussion the chaplain model. Yes, you stand on the bridge with the captain and admiral. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to talk to them. But you got to go down and talk to Charlie in the in the engine room. Well, I'm going to do something you probably never thought I'd do. <laughs> the one defense I can give for Lancaster, and there is only one because it was an apostate hellhole theologically, but the one defense I'll give it is because of the remnants of Mercersburg that hung on is they did pastoral theology well. See, Mercersburg theology is all about incarnation. It's oh, all okay. about the incarnation. Yeah. So when I got there, even when I got there and it had gone apostate, we were required to spend 20 hours a week every year. All through every, and when I say 20, I mean 20 hours a week, every week for three years doing pastoral ministry. A week? A week. A week. Wow. Now, our first year, it had, oh, I say pastoral, our first year, we had to work in a church doing a non-pastoral duty. So like my first year, I worked at Christ Lutheran, and I worked with the youth program. The next two years, we had to work in, no, it was Grace Lutheran where I did the youth ministry. Next two years, we had to work as an associate pastor somewhere, 20 hours a week. So I did faith reform my second year and Christ Lutheran my third year because the UCC wouldn't, they cut all the UCC churches off from me trying to get me out. But we were required to have that. We were required to have a semester. We had a class also each semester where we would gather together in groups and work through books on pastoral ministry and not just the liberal hippie stuff. I mean, we talked about Jay Adams. We talked about, I wish I could find my copy of it. There was a Disciples of Christ pastor that wrote a book on uh, pastoral ethics and etiquette that was really good. We talked about how we are to interact with people. They made us learn how to be a pastor. You see, at Westminster, we had guys in there that had never been a pastor. You know, there's, and yet it's supposed to be for ministerial training, you know. But that's part of the problem with the church. I mean, you look at Polycarp, you look at Irenaeus, you look at all of them, you look at Augustine. They were boots on the ground guys. Yeah. yeah. Nobody is going to argue Augustine wasn't one of the most intellectual academic human beings that ever lived. Yeah. But Augustine was writing a letter, writing these letters to all these people. He was on the ground doing pastoral ministry. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, what's the point of the theology unless it plays out in what we do? It's like in education. The problem we have with the education system is you have all these people teaching you how to be an educator that's never actually taught a single class. <laughs> Listen, brother, we got to kind of slow it down here. We got about three minutes. Let me just pray and then we can uh, filibuster for a minute or two. All right. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to thy holy church the care and nurture of children and young adults, enlighten with wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we got a couple minutes to filibuster before we sign off. I'm. I, we didn't even get to. I got about a thousand questions here. <laughs> we got. I told you, Donald. I'll talk to you anytime you want to. Well, it's the idea, as you said in the opening prayer, is for the edification. We hopefully younger guys will listen to this and learn from the older guys. And um, I'm going to see if I can get JT Brantley and see. I, I did put out an invitation to Dan Sparks, but no, 
response. So well, Dan's caught up in a bunch of stuff. Dan's got a lot of work on his plate right now. Because part of the problem with Dan is, is he's bivocational and he's working. He's not only a bishop and he's not only doing pastoral work, he's working as that at the VA hospitals. Uh, and you couldn't get me to do that for love nor money. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't I mean, know. You, I mean, you know all about government red tape, Donald. And <laughs> Dan's probably got about twice as much to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't get very far here. Uh, one quickie, one quick question. Oh. Supposing you, supposing Bishop Robinson began requiring or allowing for the intercession of saints, say 50 saints, it's okay to pray to them, to invoke them, to pray to the departed. What do you say? I'd say I would bring him up on charges of violating the 39 articles that he subscribed to just as well as I am. Okay. Well, we've got documentary evidence that a certain man in Dallas has put his imprimatur to that. And we'll be discussing that a little further. Anyways, well, I got I'm sorry. We're subscribed. We have, when we joined the UECNA, we have to sign on the dotted line. Yep. Listen, we got to go. We'll be back again. I'm out of pocket at the end of the week, and we'll, we'll see what we'll see. I got Bishop Malcolm, Edward Malcolm of the Church of England continuing in Friday. So anyways, got to go. All right. Awesome. Talk to you later, Donald. Bye-bye.